Good morning, RCC family, and happy Easter. If you're joining us for the very first time, we are so happy that you're here with us. So I don't think anyone would have guessed a few weeks ago that this is how we would be spending Easter. But I think that this season actually allows us to understand the gift of the gospel better. You see, right now, we are feeling the ache of being socially distanced from those that we love and giving the chance we would love to be in community. And the Father understands this perfectly, so much so, in fact, that he sent his son to walk alongside us and do life with us and then ultimately die in order to ensure a connection and ensure a new world where death and disease would have no claim on us. We have a better perspective of the beauty and the revelation that this special day holds, and so even though we're separate, I believe that God has something for you this morning. So hey, are you guys wearing your Sunday best or are you rocking out in your pajamas? And are you doing something special for the day? Comment below and let us know or send us a photo. You can tag us at River City ATL and use your hashtag RCC Church Everywhere. Now for our announcements. If you'd like to receive prayer, please contact us at prayer at rivercitysmyrna.com. You can also call our prayer line throughout the service and leave a message requesting prayer. And then our prayer teams will contact you at the end of service. If you have a need, be it financial or otherwise, please contact needs at River City Smyrna. We would love to support you. And if you feel impressed to give, thank you so much. Well, you can go to our homepage, rivercitysmyrna.com slash giving, and then give to an area that you feel called. Now, that was a lot of information to remember. Lucky for you, you don't have to because everything will be in your service guide. If you haven't downloaded it yet, go to our Facebook page or our prayer wall and download the guide there. It's gonna have all of the readings for today's service and some really helpful Easter things for you and your family. Now, today's psalm. Today's psalm is taken from 118, one to two, and then 14 to 24. It'll also be page three in your guide. And it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim, his mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. There is sounds of exultation and victory and the tents of righteousness. His right hand of the Lord has triumphed, and the right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has punished me sorely, but did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness and I, I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you for you have answered me and become my salvation. The same stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day, the Lord has acted, and we will rejoice in it. So Father, today is a day amongst days where we celebrate the work of the cross and the triumphant resurrection of your Son. God, we thank you that your presence is here with us today. And although we are separate and things seem a little less festive, Lord, that heaven is still celebrating and that the invitation is open to us to still celebrate. And so we pray that your spirit is tangible and felt in the homes of everyone watching today. Lord, I pray a special blessing over people who are tuning in for the first time, for the hundredth. Lord, we pray that your work is understood with better clarity today and in this season and that hope isn't just for the things that have already happened, but that we grasp onto the hope of what's to come. We love you so much. You are an awesome savior. In your name we pray, amen. You came, you broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us, but by your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out of the grave, you called me into the light. You called my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. 
miracle working God. It's you who are your miracle working God. You are your miracle working God. I know that you are your miracle working God. You are. Yes, you And 
Throned on the highest parade, and you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. And now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest parade. Oh, you reign above it all. You reign above it all. Oh, over the universe and over. Precious blood of the Lamb. 
Okay, now it's time for prayers of the people, if you'll join me in praying. For the Universal Church, its members, and its mission. Lord, we thank you for the work of the cross and the resurrection, which unite your bride across this globe. As we celebrate Easter Sunday with our brothers and sisters around the world, we ask for the truth of your love and your gospel message to be apparent in our lives. As churches everywhere around the world are meeting without meeting, are adjusting their gatherings to protect its members and those they serve, we humbly ask for unity, encouragement, hope, mercy, and grace. We ask for your felt presence to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, especially to the many who may feel isolated, lonely, or hopeless. Lord, bring your resurrection hope, life, and joy for the world and all those in it. God, we thank you for the life that you have created here and for giving your son because you so loved this world. We pray for the leaders of the nations to have wisdom as they face the effects of the coronavirus. We pray for the people whose jobs or income have been disrupted. Provide for them, Lord. We pray for those working in medical fields, hospitality, and essential roles. Please strengthen them, help them not to grow weary, bring refreshment to them. We pray for those who are sick or have lost loved ones. Lord, bring your resurrection hope, life, and joy. For the welfare of Smyrna and Cobb County, Lord, we thank you for our homes and businesses in our city and our county. We thank you for the leaders here. We ask, Lord, that you would grant them wisdom as they lead us through this time. As, extent, as extensions on sheltering in place continue, we pray for the mental health, financial health, and physical health of those surrounding us. May we be a light and bring love to our community. Awaken us to the ways that we can be your hands and your feet here. To those who are at higher risk, we ask that they would be cautious but not overwhelmed or paralyzed by fear and anxiety. Bring your peace. Lord, bring your resurrection hope, life, and joy to our city and county. And Lord, to our, for our local community and all those who suffer in it, God, we are grateful for our church and its members. We are thankful for technology that can help us to gather even during sheltering in place. Lord, we ask that you be with those of us as we are with our families, that we would have patience and that love would fill our homes. We ask for those in our body who are alone, would you give them your presence and your peace? For those whose jobs have been lost or income has been diminished, God, would you provide for them from your endless resources? For those who are working more than ever before, please provide sustainability and rest. For those who feel like their dreams are shattered or there's no hope, and those who are wrestling with their faith, God, would you remind them, remind them of your love and your kindness and that you see them and you know them. Lord, bring your resurrection, hope, life, and joy to those in our body and close community. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take up offering now. You can give online at rivercitysmyrna.com slash giving. And you're invited to read the offering prayer with me. You can find it on page seven in your worship guide. Mighty God of resurrection and redemption, we offer our gifts alongside our alleluias. We offer our hands and feet and voices to take the celebration out of this place into a world that desperately needs hope. May we go into the world with such energy, excitement, and power that the ground shakes once again, that lightning flashes, and that people see in us your redeeming love and the triumph of light over darkness. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. We want to thank everyone who sent in the Easter videos, and we hope that you all enjoy watching those now. Easter. He is, he is risen. risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter River City Church. He is risen. We rejoice because he is alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Happy Easter, everyone. We miss you.
Hey, River City, here's your virtual hug from the Harveys. Happy Easter! The tomb is empty. He is risen! Happy Easter! He is risen! He is risen indeed! Happy, Happy Easter. Easter! Christ has died! Christ has risen! Christ is coming again! Happy Easter, Happy River City, City family! Happy Easter! Happy Easter, everyone! Aria, say Happy Easter! Say Happy Easter! Good job! <laughs> Happy Easter! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed. O oh death, where is thy victory? O oh death, where is thy sting? And he has conquered the grave. Happy, Happy Easter, Easter, RCC. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, is risen. Christ, Christ, Christ will come again. again. Happy, Happy Easter, Easter, River City Christ family. family. <laughs> We're goofy. Happy, Happy Easter. Easter. <laughs> Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy quarantine from the longer whiters. Household fam. fam. Gang gang buzz buzz. <laughs> from procession to graveyard, a lot can happen in a week. From procession to graveyard, they threw palms at his feet. They welcomed him like royalty and Hosanna, they sang. They thought of him a king of earthly rule and throne. And others saw him as a threat to the system that they vowed to uphold. But some knew of his miracles and his lessons and his heart that he was both God and man, and that they both played a part. On Monday, he wrecked the temple, serrated profit from praise, knocking over money tables. He made lofty claims. Destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. Destroy my body, and my father will do the same. He taught the crowds on Tuesday about the kingdom of God that what is done to the least of these, it's as if it was done unto God. It was an upside down kingdom where the last would be first and the widow and the orphan would always know its worth. He spoke with so much compassion and yet the leaders hated him. With a bounty on his head on Wednesday, Judas betrayed him. Yet on Thursday, he prepared a table in the presence of his enemy. He broke the bread and blessed the wine and told us to partake and eat. And then he knelt on the ground and began to wash our feet like he was a servant and not a king. On Friday, they took him in the garden while he prayed. And he could have called down angels he, he could have called down angels and they, they would have come, but he knew his mission and what would be done. And some people begged for justice and mercy, but most demanded blood. And in an act of holy surrender, he would provide each one. Here was our salvation. We were waiting for all this time since Eve blamed the snake and Adam blamed his wife. Countless generations waiting for this one moment. And when it was upon us, we didn't recognize or know it. And so we mourned and we grieved. And on Sabbath, we were silent because our savior was gone. And so was the hope inside us. But it was a Sunday, the day our hope came back. It was a Sunday, the death was defeated and the captive was set free. You see, while we were sleeping and deep in our slumber, the earth began to shake with glory and wonder and the rocks cried out at the sight of his face and holy submission to their creator. The boulders just rolled away. You see, it was a Sunday, the day the cynics went silent and the hopeful began to sing glory to God in the highest. 
and from the highest of heaven to the lowest of lows to a woman, yes, a woman. It was God's first hello. And from a procession to a cross, from a graveyard to glory, you'd think it'd be the end of the story. From a procession to a cross, from a graveyard on to glory, this is not the end. It is the beginning of the story. From a procession to a cross, from a graveyard to glory, this is not the end. It is the beginning of the story. This, this is not the end. It's the beginning of the story. Hey, River City family, really glad to be with you, even though we're being together from a distance. Happy Easter. He has definitely risen. It's a strange and interesting time, but we're at least together this morning celebrating the risen Christ with our families, with the body of Christ, and all across the globe this morning, people are celebrating the resurrected Christ. The story we're going to get into today involves confusion, doubt, franticness, people scurrying everywhere, not understanding what's happening. It really paints a picture of the kind of season we're actually in as a church and just a people. Is this virus going to continue? Am I going to get it? What are the symptoms? What does it mean if I do get it? How many people are getting it? And it doesn't seem like there's information that's really reliable other than Facebook, which is always reliable, as we know. And so we're kind of left in this space where we're kind of up in arms. What's gonna happen? How's it gonna, how are we gonna survive? How's life gonna continue on? We all kind of know at this point it's gonna be different, but what are we being invited into? And today for Easter, the passage we're gonna read talks about a couple things that I really feel like is important for us as the body right now. And so for Easter, why do people come to Easter? This year's different. We're not having people gather in churches, but we all know that in the South especially, people join and come from all over. Seats are full this Sunday. Seats are empty. There's three people in this room with me right now. But people come on Easter day, right? And, and for the New Testament church, this is kind of a strange day to build our invitation around, but it makes sense, right? This is a day that includes doubt and faith. It includes things we have to wrestle with. It's for us, as Carl Barr says, it's a way for us to ask the question that all of our hearts are asking even right now, is this story true? Is it true that there's something about this that's so foundational and important that I can actually build my life on it and I can teach my kids about it and involve my family in it to embody it? Is this story true? Did death actually get conquered? Is life everlasting really possible? Is resurrection a reality? This is why I believe people show up over and over again. I do think it's cultural sometimes in America, but people come asking the question and we carry with us the things that we've seen. About this time every year, stories come out about somebody finding something that could prove or not prove that Jesus was resurrected and just a little artifact or another thing to paint a picture. We also wrestle with our thoughts about the Christian experiences we've had, the churches we've been a part of, even maybe this church for some of you that have done things that you're left wondering, that's definitely not the way that I think Jesus would do it. We've had to interact with our own doubts and fears that we just carry as humans. Is, is my life gonna get better? Am I going to move into a space that I wanna be in? Am I, am I living this the right way? We ask these questions, but we're always kind of leaning into the larger question. Is this real? Is it true? Did Jesus do this? As people gather all over, that's an important question. I was talking to a friend of mine this week, Dr. Waddell, who I've quoted a ton. Um, I've loved how his church, Oasis Church, has handled um, being the body in Florida during the season. And he said, this is a season where you have, to, you have to think through a couple things. One is, it's one thing to believe that or believe in something, believe that something. And there's another thing to believe in. So let me say that again. Believing that is different than believing in. 
And sometimes centuries set in to build a framework in us that helps us to stand at a distance and believe that something is. But to believe in something is a whole different way to be. And now in this season, it's kind of removing some of those facades and lenses and lids and allowing us to interact within ourselves. Do I really do I really believe this story is real, right? Like these kind of seasons do that. You can tell when someone believes in something. I actually lead a Wednesday night group and Ashley Carmen, who's a part of our church, leads it with me. And when she talks from her heart about helping people and wanting to see people grow in God, it's not something that she believes that works. It's something that she believes in with her whole being. And all of her talks about it. When I talk to my wife, Sarah, about the practices of the church and how this gospel has gotten to us and things like the Eucharist and things like prayer and things like passing the peace even, these things that for me aren't things that I've historically understood. When she discusses these things, it's as if she's speaking about something that's hers and everyone that talks to her about it knows it. For Christians right now, we're interacting with, do we believe that this is real or do we believe in this, right? Are we able to embrace it and embody it? Embrace this gospel and embody this gospel. So I'm gonna read to you John 20, one through 18 today. You can open with me in your Bible and I will read to you from my version here. You've all heard this before. I've actually preached from this before. You've heard it so many times, in fact, that I just wanna pause for a moment and ask that through the power of the Spirit, which is alive and active, even in the reading of the word, that he would, that the Spirit of God would allow you to interact with this text as if it's alive. Not if it's just a reading that we read last Easter and that you read when you were a kid and maybe you read with your family this week, but that you're interacting with a person almost. That when we read this, it's not just a thing that's coming from a screen to you, but it's a thing that's diving into the depths of you. Father, I invite that type of work in this text. Your word is alive. We're so thankful that we can go to the word because the word is you, Jesus. And through this, the power of the spirit and community, this is just like this lively, rich seed bed for these things to grow. And as we discuss this chapter today, let it be through new eyes, God. In Jesus' name. This is John 20, 1 through 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the, one, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went in the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linens cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, said her name. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, 
which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. We're going to pray again. Father, we thank you for the text on Easter Sunday and the Spirit of God alive in our homes, moving about on our couches and our kitchens, ever present, so present right now. You are very with us and you are offering this story from scripture individually from the heart of God to us as families to take and eat and drink on the gospel of Jesus and the words of our Lord and the experiences of these people as they interacted with them real time. We thank you for this letter, this hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I'm gonna jump right in. So I mentioned this a little earlier, but Easter as a start is maybe not the best starting point. And we know this because we've just actually traveled through Holy Week and we've seen and traveled along the same story that the disciples and even Mary and the other women in this story that come later are interacting with, right? They've seen that Jesus entered a city. They've seen him go into the temple and flip the tables over. They've seen him stand before teachers of the law and correct them. They've seen him fight for people who need to be fought for. They've seen him speak life into them. They've seen him taken from them. They've seen Jesus lied about, spit upon. They've seen shame surface around his name, which didn't need to come. They've seen him be destroyed, even unto death. They've watched all this. Two days, three days into it, they're now in a set reality that Jesus is not there. He's not present. What they thought might happen did not happen. That's their reality. That's not becoming their reality. That's the truth of where they are in this passage. Going into resurrection as the starting point, you see as churches begin after, after Jesus ascends to the Father, after the Holy Spirit comes and acts, and after Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit and the church begins, you see that the message they start to tell people is actually the story of Easter. They start to go around and share, do you know that the risen Lord? If you see the, the, the passage or the, the sermon that Peter teaches in Acts, it's all about the resurrection of Jesus. And it's risky to do it that way, to invite people to begin into one of the most difficult things to believe. And it's difficult for them to believe as, as much as it is for us, if we really interact with it. There's a person who was God in flesh, who was raised from the dead. Our story is starting there. As you heard Mariah speak of earlier, this is the beginning. We would like to invite you in. And it's interesting to be an inviting spot because there's no way to interact with that without having some kind of doubt surface. I wanna read you this from Martin Copenhagen. It says this, there was something in the story that reached the deepest regions of their hearts and minds where both doubt and faith were found. This is in the resurrection, God gave us such a miracle of love and forgiveness that it is worthy of faith and thus open to doubt. They were, they were doubts we may hold a test. I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna start that part over. The very doubts we may hold attest to the scale and the power of what we proclaim. So the place to begin in the life of faith is not necessarily with those things we never doubt, right? As many of us were taught, realities about which we hold no doubt may not be large enough to reveal God to us. So we say without apology or hesitation, what we proclaim at Easter is too mighty to be encompassed by certainty, too wonderful to be found only within the borders of our imaginations. And they start explaining the gospel of Jesus, inviting people into a story that would instantly stir doubts and the possibilities of faith. That's beautiful. But I wanna talk specifically about two characters in this story, right? If this were a play for people who are in theater, Sarah, some people even in this room, 
good at that. I'm not at all skilled in theater. It's my most horrifying space if I had to pretend to be. It's not a comfortable space for me. But in this story, there's an unlikely hero character. And the hero character is actually Mary. Mary's the one who draws the story together. Mary starts, Mary is sent. Mary runs away from something beautiful only to run back in a little bit, only to interact with it. And she's talking to Jesus and we all see it. We're like, Mary, that's Jesus. No, that's Jesus to start. And then the gardener's Jesus and Mary's clueless. We see the story unfolding and we see Mary at the end being sent. But what's happening with Mary? She didn't actually witness the actual resurrection. She didn't show up and see Jesus. Being, nobody did. For, for some people, this would be a reason to not believe. For me, this actually helps my faith be built because faith is the substance of things, substance of things not seen. If there were such certainty, it wouldn't stir in us the things that need to be stirred for the gift of faith to be given to us. There's no gift of certainty listed in the scriptures. There is the gift of faith. And she doesn't see it, but she comes back and interacts with it. She's the first person to understand what happens. She shows up, she goes in, she interacts with Jesus, she's grieving and even in tears, and then she interacts with who she thinks is the gardener just wanting to go take this body because she would like to do with it what needs to be done with it. And the gardener looks directly at her and says her name. And she is not theologically apt. She is not the fastest runner. It, definitely not the fastest runner in the story. She's already visited twice. Like Peter was the bravest by far. She's not the most, she's not an apprentice to Jesus really. She's kind of a friend. She's the first person to understand that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. And when he says her name, she gets it. She puts together in her head, oh my goodness, not only is this man saying my name, but this is Jesus. And if he is saying my name, that means he has resurrected and he has conquered death. All this happens. And then she's sent and she is the first preacher of the gospel. Jesus does all the things we don't want him to do. And even with her, her expectations are destroyed. It's as if he's saying, you expect this of me, you're not getting this. Because she showed up certain that he was dead and that she needed to take his body. He was not having that. He was resurrected, ready to say her name and send her on mission to embody the gospel as the first preacher of the gospel with the words, I have seen the Lord. I have seen him. Also to say, I understand what's happening and all you jokers need to get this. So she's sent to the men or to those who should be preaching this gospel as the first gospel and they come back and it's beautiful, right? She lacks theological certainty, but she has an experience that she knows is even more real. She simply heard her name and he saw through the tears and maybe the story is about how Jesus reaches more deeply and more easily into the grieving hearts and the, the poor in spirit and blessed are the broken because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And maybe this is the story of Jesus saying to us, where there is brokenness, that's where I'll be. Because who's being resurrected if they're alive? There's no resurrection story about someone who's walking around living. Resurrection happens when there's a death and there has to be a tomb and a grave for there to be resurrection. She's the first to experience this, but she's not the first to believe. There's another player in this story who's kind of on the peripherals. I think most of us think we know who he is, but there's definitely a play on this to show not naming this person, but this person shows up with Peter, the eventual rock of the church, who was kind of historically someone who did not get anything about Jesus, continually misunderstood him. We think we know who this is, the disciple that Jesus loved, reaches the tomb first. Peter runs by, 
goes in, does not believe. This person stands at the tomb. I don't know why he's standing at the tomb. Like he's just standing at the tomb. And then all of a sudden after Peter goes in, he goes in and it says he believes. He doesn't even see Jesus interact with a gardener or talk to two angels. He just goes in and believes. And this to me is huge for people who can't see Jesus raised with certainty because I believe that what it's saying is the gift of faith is needed to be given and it's needed to be given now. And you haven't seen and you didn't watch him raised from a grave. But the gift of faith from God through the spirit and the power of God gives us the kind of faith that says, I believe this is true, even though I knew he was dead a minute ago. This person, who is this person? Well, I I love that I heard someone this week speaking on that. I love the way that they talked about this. Who is this person? This person is blind Bartimaeus. This person is the woman at the well. This person is Sarah Luke, who was a part of our community before she passed away recently, who I would sit with her as she was transitioning, really, I guess this is the way to say it. And, and, and she was sick and she would say to me, Josh, I'm more certain now on who Jesus is. And people would say things to her like, you need to, you need to be praying for healing now. And she, she, she acted as if she was healed in a deeper way. And her faith was this person, she was this person. She's the person who stepped into the tomb and believed. We know these people in our lives. Many of us listening right now have stepped into the tomb of Jesus and believed. We believed and we've built our lives around him. Maybe we're being reminded in COVID-19 season, in a season where it's more like Good Friday than Easter Sunday, maybe we're being reminded, this is what you believe. This is the gospel you've given up everything for. Many of you have lost jobs for this. Many of you are losing jobs now. Many of you have traveled to distant places. We sent Kate Tompkins, who I hope you're listening, Kate, as a 17, 18, 19 year old on mission to live her life for the gospel. She's going in to places that don't have it. I have friends who have moved to India. I have friends who have moved to areas where they've never heard the gospel before. That just the reading of the word There's stories where this person was reading the word, not trying to make it better, not adding preacher inflection, not appearing cool, and people begin weeping just at hearing the word of God. That's the power of faith as a gift. Faith that can't be manipulated and faith that you can't be certain about because there has to be doubt somewhere for there to be faith. So these two players in this story we have here, one, goes into the tomb and he embraces this before he understands. What does it mean to embrace? Embrace means to hold someone closely in one's arms, especially as a sign of affection, to accept or support a belief theory or change willingly and enthusiastically. And this is what he did. He stepped in to the grave, to the tomb, He didn't stay at the door, and as he got in, he believed. And then we have someone who has embodied this gospel, a woman, the first preacher of the gospel. We owe a lot to her willingness to do this, right? And I just wanna read this to you because it's this important. The first sermon, it was delivered by a woman, and this is Clayton Schmidt. She saw and believed and announced. She did not require ordination or an accredited preaching course. She required only a word from Jesus. Then she went and told, here's the message for us. Christ is risen, go tell someone else, it's real. She embodied, what does it mean to embody? To be, it's been up there, right? Just been there, I like it. Be an expression or give a tangible or visible form to an idea, quality, or feeling to include or contain something as a consistent part to embody this gospel. What is our world? When it looks more like Good Friday has been the first three months of this year, and most of our world doesn't know the Jesus who loves so well that he loves to the point of death for others, even those who wouldn't choose him, who would fight against him. Most of our world doesn't know that Jesus, right? So what does our world need now on Easter Sunday, right? What are we being invited into? If not to embrace this more fully than we ever have been able to and to embody it 
so clearly. And where do we go to embody it? Where are the tombs? Where are the tombs in our lives, right? The first Christians would actually build their churches underground next to tombs, next to places they would actually weep on losing people. So their worship was actually in the places that they weeped. Their worship was richly connected to it being connected to graves where they saw death. Where do we embody this message? Who needs the gospel? Who is broken? Who is poor in spirit? If not all of us right now. I mean, this is really like a softball serve to the Christian community that's been praying to be the kind of community that embodies the message of the gospel to a city that needs Jesus, but that was so busy in their wealth and so busy in their jobs and so busy in their sports that they couldn't see what they actually needed. They didn't know how to name the thirsts in their heart. Now they can. And now many people are attentive to our Jesus. And they're asking, is there someone like the woman in this story who can go tell of a love that's so different from everyone else who can talk about people who love so differently from everyone else that it's actually desirable. And it's not our job to make people believe the gift of faith from Jesus through the cross of Jesus, the resurrected Christ is the gift that's needed and that will be given as we share the word of our testimony, we share the heart of the message of the gospel, This particular gospel speaks of the resurrection differently than the synoptics. In this one, there's actually a focus on the ascension, which is interesting. It's almost like, as I've read this before, I've been like, I don't, I I understand this Easter. We're talking about the resurrection, right? Like, why are we going through this conversation with don't touch me, I need to be ascended. I have to be ascended to my father. And it's this beautiful way that the writer is kind of flipping the script and saying, this is not just the day that the project of Jesus and his ministry died and something else came about. This is the day that death is conquered because there's a life in God that is possible. And he is actually talking about ascending into the life of God. This is the life and you don't even have to die right right now in physical form to receive it. Through Jesus, we can ascend to our Father and we can embody the life of God that is available where death does not destroy, where Jesus gets the last word. He conquered all of that and invited us in. And even in the process of destroying death, he's actively living a life with his Father. That is a beautiful picture of what we're being invited into when we're staying in our homes, when we're wondering what will come. The life of God is alive now. It's active and the body of Christ should embody it and should embrace it and we can be invited into it. And that's such a beautiful thing. I don't know, I started in my first point and I I just ended in my closing and I think I'm good with it. I think I'm good with it. But I think today, I just want to share with you If God is anything in this story, it's not what we thought he was going to be. And he is surprising and they don't see him coming. And even when he shows up, they don't realize it's him. Like many of us are in conversations with people right now that Jesus is so entrenched in, but we can't even, we can't even see him in it. He's working, right? I would just say this, watch yourself this year because Jesus is sneaky and he is on the move and he is ready to surprise you. And it doesn't matter if you set it up all right. It doesn't matter if you bury the body correctly. He's sneaky, right? He might be a gardener. He could be a couple angels. He could be the conversation with the person you have from across the street for the first time, even though you've lived next to him for 10 years. Jesus is ever present on the move and he's inviting me and you in. Guys, this is, this Easter is not just about this day. This is the time for the body to be the body. This is the best time for the body to be the body since I've been in the body and had a body. I know that was a dad joke, that's okay. I'm gonna pray. Jesus, gosh, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be in a time like this and to be able to combat all those fears that surface. 
Like, what if I'm infected, which is real? Or what do I do with a friend that's infected? Or what, what if I lose my job? Or, right, like, right, these stories that look like this don't ever end well. They don't end the way that you've ended them. But that's the thing is you're inviting us into this to say the way that you would end or have seen things end or deal with death or tombs or things that appear to be dead, I don't deal with those the way that you do. I do different things with those, much more deep and meaningful things. You don't get to figure it out. You get to be a part. You get to listen to the invitations of the Spirit. I just went from prayer to preaching again. So Father, just help us to be the church, River City Church, First Baptist Church, First Methodist Church, Square Church, Cumberland Community Church, all the other churches, God. Vinings Church, Vinings Lake Church, Second Baptist Church, Third Baptist Church, Riverstone Church. All of these opportunities, God, let us step in. Let us even say, God, I'll, I'll do it. Whatever, whatever you're asking me to do, this life is too good. It tastes too good. It's too real. I want to embody this, invite us into that, continue us, God, in this beginning part of the story, the part that begins into the life of God. And on this Easter, God, we honor you as king above all kings who does things that no other king is willing to do, humble things, God, to show us the way of the cross and the attitude and the posture of the kingdom. We honor you as the servant Lord, we honor you as the shepherd king, we honor you as the spirit of God, we honor you as the one moving in our midst right now. Listen, close your eyes, even though you're in a different space on a different day, time is nothing to him. The Holy Spirit is inviting us to a deeper life. Listen to his invitation, it's for you. It's for your kids who can't calm down. And this is the way, the way of our lives and the way of the gospel. Thank you, Jesus, that we get to walk in it. We love you guys. Hope you have an awesome Easter today. My one challenge today, other than the eight challenges I already challenged you with, probably. If you have seen Christ, if you have looked into the tomb ever in your life and feel within you, this thing that says, this is real. Share it to someone, somewhere. Do something with it. Listen to the encouragement of this woman saying, I saw the Lord, go and tell. And Father, I pray that you would go with us this week. In your name we pray, amen. Love you guys. So we're gonna open up the lines for prayer and we'd like to pray with you. We know that a lot of you are going through a lot of really tough things right now and we think it's important to partner with you in that and pray with you. And so we'd like you to call this number. And we know there was a struggle the last couple of weeks. So if you get the line and it's busy, call back, just be patient and someone really will pray with you and wants to pray with you. And so, amen.